The message this morning is entitled, But Who Are You? Well, Father, we pray in the name of Jesus and through the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray, Lord, that your word would penetrate our very being. Lord, that we would hear from you, directly from you, Lord. Lord, that this word would move mightily, Lord, in all of us and those watching. Lord, you have your way. Your kingdom come and your will be done. Lord, forgive me for any of my failures. Lord, but you look past our weaknesses. Lord, you discipline those whom you love and you strengthen those whom you love. Lord, that is what is so great about you, Lord, that when we are weak, you are strong. So it is not in my strength or reasoning or understanding that I lean upon this morning, but upon you, Holy Spirit, that you would truly speak and set us to a place of victory and that you be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Again, but who are you? But who are you? In Mark chapter 16, verse 15 through 20, Jesus died and rose from the dead and he is about to go to a place at the right hand of the Father. And so before he leaves, he gives some final uh, instructions on this new found church, this brand new church, this body of believers who is about to set the world upside down. Amen? Amen. And that is the church that you are a part of today. Amen. And so he gives them the Great Commission. And I believe the Great Commission throughout the church age has been twisted, uh, turned around upside down, added a little salt and pepper. You know, we've doctored it, we've altered it. Why? When Christ's word is good enough. Amen. So this morning, I want to talk with you about who we are. And, you know, for those that may be here or watching live on the Internet, you may not be a Christian, but this is going to speak to you as well. You know, the fact is, is that God created us, but we, aside from Adam and Eve, we were born with, a, with, a, with that sin nature. We have all fallen short of the glory of God, and we have all have been separated by God because of our sin. But what Jesus Christ did on the cross has made a way for anyone who truly accepts him as the only son of God, as their Lord and their Savior, that they will come into a, a fellowship, an eternal fellowship with God, and they will begin to be a new creation. That's what that means. And for many of you, you know that. It's elementary teaching to you. But sometimes we can forget elementary things. Along with that call comes the Great Commission. See, these men had walked with Christ three and a half years, and they had seen, witnessed, and took part in many great miracles. And then, in the most darkest hour of humanity, the most darkest hour of Christ, he was abandoned, he was rejected. And Peter was exposed for who he really was. And Judas was exposed for who he really was. All of them were. And they came to a point where Judas went out and hung himself. Peter went back fishing. Because see, apart from Jesus, who are we? But in Christ, who are you? And so he mends their broken hearts. And in Mark chapter 16, he gives them the Great Commission. And before he leaves, he says to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. But he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who have believed. In my name, the name of Jesus, 
They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will pick up serpents. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. So then, when the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the word by the signs that followed. You see, a problem today is that many of believers chase after the signs, the miracles, and the wonders. They seek after the gift of the Spirit when we are really called to follow Christ and to, and to desire the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, there is nothing wrong with the gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift, all the gift, nine gifts of the Holy Spirit are here today to empower the church to do the work, to do the, fulfill the Great Commission. But what does it mean that we will, we will cast out demons? Well, it simply means that. There are some people in this earth who have demonic spirits in them. And the only people that have been placed on this earth to have power over that are people who know Jesus are people who are filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. It says also that you will speak with new tongues. Now, this could go both ways. It could mean, yes, you speak in a, a new spiritual tongue, you know, the, the, the gift of speaking in different tongues, language, earthly languages, heavenly languages. Paul even talks about that. But Paul even said in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, he said, I can speak in the tongues of angels and the tongues of men, but if I have not love, I'm just a noisy symbol, a noisy gong. So there's nothing wrong with the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but it's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The first one, even being love, is the one that we must strive for every day and attain after. Now, it says here they will pick up serpents. Now, we know here in America, in the backwoods of Kentucky and Tennessee, there are some denominations that believe you literally can pick up cobras and, and uh, they're not going to strike you. And that, that is ridiculous. Because the Bible says, don't test God. The only place God says, test me, is in the tithes and offerings. That's the only time God ever says, test me on this. But you will pick up serpents. And what does that mean? It literally means not just you can cast out demons, but it literally means that you will be able, as a Christian, to deal with the kingdom of Satan on this earth. You know, you have to understand something. When you become a Christian, the devil sees it and the devil knows it. And that's why many of you, your children, your family have come under attack who don't know Christ. And that's where you come in and you pick up that serpent. And you deal with the kingdom and the activities of Satan and you cast them out of your household. You break uh, curses that have been handed down from generation to generation to generation. What did Jesus Christ say to Peter? He said, I will build my church on you, Peter. You're going to be the first preacher, so to speak. He goes, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against my church. Jesus Christ said, the only thing that will ever be instituted on the earth that can go against the kingdom of Satan is the church of Jesus Christ. Now, this building is not a church. It's just a place that houses the church. You who have Christ in you, you are the church. Now, you will also drink deadly poison and it will not hurt them. Satan is going to come against you sometimes. You know, the first time I ever read this as a baby Christian, I thought of when you go to a restaurant and you reject some food and they take it to the back and they spit on it and bring it back out to you. I mean, hey, that happens. Sometimes they know you're a Christian, and I'm not saying in a restaurant, but sometimes people will come at you with a plan to kill you. And God will deliver you. That's, I believe, what that really means. You know, I'm sure we can go even deeper, but we're just on the surface. And you will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. I had a brother here recently who came back from Africa. He told me that he saw people growing arms and l digits back, fingers back. Incredible miracles right before his eyes. He said, why doesn't this happen in America? He said, because people just don't want to believe. Even Jesus 
was written that Jesus did not do much miracles where he came from because they did not believe. And America does not believe anymore. We trust more in motivational speakers and, and the latest book that's come out from your favorite pastor more than what the Holy Spirit is trying to do in your life. And so therefore, we quench the Spirit of God. Therefore, we quench the miracles. There's nothing wrong with the miracles. God is a miracle maker. But when we get our eyes off of him, we cannot see the supernatural. Point and example, Peter walked on water. He was in the supernatural, a miracle. But once he got his eyes off of Jesus and looked at the waves, he began to die. And that's where we are in America, church. We're sinking. We're dying because our eyes are not on Jesus. We offer him lip service, but our hearts are far away. And that's why we don't see the miraculous cures. I used to think, why, Lord, do I lay hands on people and they don't get better? Why, Lord? And the Lord said, hey, don't feel bad, son. Ain't nothing wrong with you. It's them. Jesus couldn't even do some miracles, it said, because there was no faith. Not to say that my walk with Christ is all good. and every, No, I'm not saying that. The Lord knows my frailties and my weaknesses. But no, we're not struggling with sin here. But yes, we are always in a battle with it. So don't think that I'm talking from a pedestal. No. But sometimes you doubt yourself, Christian. Those who are faithful to Christ, you doubt yourself. Why doesn't my family member get healed from cancer? Why? I've been praying. I've been fasting. I've been believing. Why, Lord? Why? There are other things at work not just pertaining to you in this event that is happening. You can never stop praying. You can never stop fasting, believing that God will do a miracle. Because you see, when we don't see something happen, our faith is attacked. Trust in the Lord. He gave them a great commission that by doing this, people will come out of darkness and into marvelous light. So what was Jesus really saying to his disciples here? He was saying, you're going to be evangelistic. What does that mean? Evangelistic in nature, in heart. It means the seeking to convert others to a faith. In particular, the Christian faith. You're a missionary. You see, I ask people all week, give me the definition of missionary. And they'll tell me, I've had quite a bit of definitions. One told me, well, uh, it's when you decide to follow Jesus and you want to preach the gospel, so you go to another nation. Someone told me that, well, I don't know what a missionary is. And I had some different answers. And, you know, my understanding, a missionary is every Christian. Every Christian is a missionary. You do not have to cross the world to be a missionary you just have to go outside and cross the street to be a missionary. America is one of the biggest harvest fields in the world. There are missionaries from Brazil, Panama, Russia, coming to America <laughs> to spread the gospel of Christ. I've met some. Wow. Wow. What does a missionary do when they go to another nation? They study the land. They study the culture. They look at the weaknesses and the strengths, you know, where, where God has, has strongholds, you know, and where Satan has strongholds. They notice these things. They look. Sometimes they have to get a job, and they have to work as preach, they preach the gospel. That's no different from being in America and living. You see strongholds. Yeah, don't hang around that bar. No, to go to the bingo hall on Wednesday night. Waste all your money. You see certain strongholds in America, but you see where God has a stronghold too. You have to work, but you also have a mission and an opportunity to share the gospel. So you don't have to be going around the world to be a missionary. No, church, we are all missionaries. And so the question is, how is your missionary work going today? 
You see, because here's the thing. When, Christ, when you became a Christian, you signed up to be a missionary in the blood of Christ. If you sit there, you watching, if you have asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, if you are a Christian, you are a missionary. How many people have you led to the cross of Christ? How, are you living the gospel? It's, it's not just one thing to go out and preach and share it, but it's also to live the gospel of Christ. Are we being a good example? Are we allowing the Holy Spirit to come into our lives? The, the definition of an, of an evangelistic person is that they have a, 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 a desire to the, the, the share a cause. They have a zealous preaching of the gospel. And it's their mission in life to fulfill this calling that God has put in their life. I want you to please understand the mindset of these men that heard Jesus say that to them. They were the very first ones. Understand the mindset of these men who heard the word of, from the Lord. They were so greatly filled with joy because they had witnessed the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. How could they ever forget? How could you ever forget if you were there and you saw Christ do his wonderful work and then die and then to be raised from the dead? How would you feel? What would your mindset be right now if you had witnessed that? Think about it. Think about it. Let's get very serious for a moment. If you had witnessed this, what would your mindset be? I believe one of the main reasons why certain Christians, certain Christians do not understand and operate as a missionary is because they have forgotten what Jesus has done. They have forgotten the joy of being saved and what it means to be saved by Jesus and his work on the cross. You've forgotten. You could say, Michael, well, well, you know, I, I'm offended by you saying that to me. Why would you be offended? Because you see, Christ saw that in the church. In the book of Revelation, when he speaks to the seven churches with the seven letters, in the first le letter, he says to the church, you have one thing I hold against you. You have forgotten your first love. <laughs> Who is that first love of the church? Jesus. And so when we don't operate as a missionary, and that's what we all are. You don't have to be a preacher, a pastor, or a, an evangelist to say, oh, i got to be a missionary. No. All, every Christian is a missionary. Every Christian. I don't care how young you are. I don't care how old you are. I don't care if you're sick in a deathbed of cancer. I, I don't care if you're healthy and young and vibrant. And If you're a Christian... If you have Christ in your heart, you are a missionary. And one day we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ as a Christian and give an accounting for what we did with the testimony of Jesus in our lives. And so why is it that this pastor would talk to you this morning? Because we're so close, church. Some of you will get to heaven before others will. You may pass away of, a, of an illness. The Lord may just take you, say, you know what, your heart's done beating. It's time to come home. Some of you may, 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 I don't know how you're going to meet the end. Or some of us, we just all go up in the rapture of the church. And yes, I do believe that the church will be raptured up. I don't know when. Nobody knows when. But I do believe that God will call up his people at one point. But my point is, we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ as a Christian and give an accounting for what we did with the testimony of Jesus. Sowing seed. You know, you know the seed of God is in you. The, the, this testimony of Christ is in you. What, what Jesus did brought eternal life to you. You have eternal life in you. And there's a, it's a spiritual seed. Do you understand what I'm saying, church? You have a pack of seeds if you want to get very simple and and it's a pack of seeds that never runs out you can sow a million of these seeds or just one or two but you'll never run out of seeds and you reach deep into this pack of spiritual seed and you plant and you plant with the hope that 
those who are receiving that seed that you're planting would come out of darkness and into the light of Christ and be saved and set free in the name of Jesus. The joy that you had when Christ saved you and you realized you were a sinner and in need of a Savior, do you remember that? Because some of us have forgotten. But you were saved. You were set free. You were adopted into the family of God. He became your father. And he says, now go out. He says in Mark 16, he says, go into all the world. And for us, all of our world may just be right here in Alvin. Right here in Texas. That may be your entire world. But go into it and preach the gospel. Go. The Lord says, I send you. I give you permission. And how do you get, how do you go out? You know, the, when you were a sinner, when you were vile and spiritually disgusting, Jesus loved you so much. But when you got saved, and you're a Christian now, His love for you has never increased. It's always been to the max. He's always loved you to the fullest. Whether you're a sinner or a saint, He's always loved you. There is nothing you can do more that can make Him love you more. Do you understand, church? But because of His love for us to the max, the Bible says we are obligated to Him. We are obligated to Him. We, We don't earn salvation. We freely receive it from Him. But we are obligated. Romans 12, 2 says, Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is. That you may prove it. We're called to be doers of the word, not just hearers. You understand? So I'm not trying to preach a message here where we have to have works to attain salvation or keep salvation. That's not what I'm saying here. But we were saved unto good works. We were saved so that we may do good works for the Lord. His act alone, His work alone saved us. So now missionary, you missionary, we have much seed to sow. 1 Corinthians 7.23 says this. It says, you were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. Wow. 1 Corinthians 7.23. You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. You know, whether you like it or not, and whether I like it or not, we are a slave. Amen? Amen. A slave with chains or a slave with no chains. You are a slave unto the devil or you are a slave unto God. And whom the Son sets free is free indeed. You are free. Though you are a slave and a servant unto God, you are free. You are free. You are free. You are free to live. You are free to know the kingdom of God as you live on this earth. You are free. You got to hear that this morning. That Jesus can set you free. He is the chain breaker. He knows all things. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, church? Do you believe that the Lord, though he set you free, do you believe that Christ can set others that you see enslaved by the enemy? Do you believe that God can set them free? He can. He will. If you sow that seed. It's so important that we understand that God loves people through his people. God loves people through his people. And the first demonstration was that was God came down as a man. He said, I can love people in the body of flesh. And you see what I'm saying? As we follow Jesus, he was in the flesh just like us. But through God, he loved us in the flesh. And we are imitators of Christ. 
in this flesh, in our own frailties and weaknesses, God will use us to love the world. The ugly, the vile. God will use us and he will be glorified. There is such a great responsibility of being a missionary, of being a Christian. We cannot get caught up in the politics of this world. Though we are to stand for righteousness, we are to stand for justice, we are to stand for the truths of God, for the Bible. But we ought not to do it in despair. We know, you know for example, when, when the mayor of Houston subpoenaed all the pastor's sermons uh, that were involved in this lawsuit, the pastors got angry. And that they, that they started getting all political and stuff. And I was like, praise God. Here you go. Read my sermons. You might get saved. Amen. You know, And I'm not boasting here, but praise God. Amen. Because the mayor does not know the Lord. She needs to hear. And though she may think, she may think that by reading the pastor's sermons that she's not going to be influenced, but how do you know she may not be influenced? Right. And to understand that she's in need of the Savior, Jesus Christ. Yes. Well, praise God. I would have said, well, here you go. What else do you need? Because you see, this is what the Bible says. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall remain forever. Amen. What we preach in the pulpit, what we live, the gospel of Christ, it shall never pass away. Amen. Never. The, Jesus said it. It shall never pass away. No matter what every mayor, governor, king, emperor, dictator, they've tried. They've tried to crush the word of God and they couldn't do it. And it will never happen. So why do we get our feathers in a ruffle? Praise God. Here you go. Here's a sermon. Read it. You want more? I can give you the past 10 years of sermons. Come on now. If it will give me an audience with you, I would love to talk to you. But we get offended for the wrong reason. We cannot get political in these things. We have a mission. We are Christians. We have a mission to spread the gospel. And we got to know, like, don't laugh, but there's a song by Kenny Rogers. You got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them. You know, as a Christian, you got to know when you're welcome and when you're not welcome. And if they don't want to hear it, okay, it's time to go to the next place. You don't have an angry heart to anybody. We're not at battle with people, with flesh and blood, but we're at battle with powers of darkness, the kingdom of Satan. Yeah. And when we understand this, when we get a couple of things in alignment, in check with our spirit, we begin to get on a path that the Holy Spirit is leading us on for where we now operate as a faithful missionary. Amen. Because at the end of my life, Christian, at the end of your life, what all that is really going to matter is who did you lead to the cross? Not how much money you had in the bank account. You see, the Egyptian kings, they all thought that, the pharaohs. That's why they took all that gold with them, because they thought they could take it with them. But it's there, and it's in museums all over the world. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yes. Naked we came into this world, and naked we shall leave. But, but Christ Amen. stepped in Amen. and said, you can bring some in with you. See, that's what Jesus said, store your treasures in heaven. You know what my treasure is? Those who come to know Christ. Amen. And when they go into heaven one day, that, that's my treasure. That's my treasure. That's got to be all of our treasure. Amen. And along the way, Christian, you're going to have some bumps and bruises. It's not easy. To go from a drunk and a murderer at heart to now <laughs> this Christian walk and learn and be broken and, and, and learn what it means to humble yourself. It's not easy. It's not easy. It takes a lifetime to just barely get there. But what the Lord looks for is people who don't fall down and stay down. You may get knocked this way and that way, but you keep going forward. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 through 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 through 20 says this. Or do you not know? 
Christian, he's speaking to the Christian, that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. You see, that's what it means to be reborn again. I died. Some people tell me, what happened, Michael? You used to drink and party. I had a brother-in-law tell me that one time. You don't drink no more? And I'm like, no, sir. He goes, oh, you must have done something really bad. And I looked at him. I said, yeah, I sure did. I did something really bad. I realized that I offended a God, a holy God. <laughs> that, that, yeah, I sure did. See, when we're reborn again, our body don't belong to us no more. It belongs to Christ. See, President Reagan, when he was, had that assassination attempt on him, and he was supposed to die, and he came out of it, you know, you know, somebody could have their beef with him. But one thing he did say is that I was supposed to die. I'm paraphrasing this. He said, I was supposed to die, but I know that the rest of my life is, is uh, borrowed time. I was supposed to die. He said, so I'm going to dedicate the rest of my life to the purposes of God, you know. And so whether he did that or not, only God knows. But your body, Christian, is not your own. Amen. When you come out of darkness and into light and you begin to follow Christ now, your body don't belong to you no more. And that's why Jesus was able to tell these men in Mark 16, go into the world and preach the gospel. He didn't say, Peter, go back to your fishing boat and build up a big fishing empire company. He didn't say that. He said, go out and preach the gospel. What does Jesus say in Mark 6, uh, Matthew 6.33? First, seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things shall be added unto you. You're not going to know who you are, what you are, where you're going, until you first seek after Jesus. And then everything else falls right in place in due season. So, Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 4, and I'll, I read out of the NASB version, or the King James sometimes, but... Out of the Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 4. I want to read this out of the, the NLT, the New Living Translation, because it, it's a, it breaks it down a little simpler for American language, okay? More importantly for, for country folks. <laughs> There's some country folks out there. Some of y'all, hey, don't laugh, but I'm serious. Some of y'all don't, some don't really understand, you know, some heavy words here in the Bible. And so I like the way the NLT says it. It says in Colossians, Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 4, it says, Since you have been raised to new life with Christ. Set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits at the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of the earth. See, King, uh, the other version says, have your mind on things above, not on things on below. It says, think about the things of heaven, not, a, not the things of the earth. For you died to this life, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. See, when Jesus comes, you're going to be in his glory. You know, they may say bad things about you. They may lie about you, specifically because you are a Christian. Now, now sometimes we mess up and do things and we get caught up in drama and, you know, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when they lie about you because you're a Christian. When you're doing the work of the Lord and they gossip about you and you just want to punch somebody in the face. Hey, come on now. You know, sometimes you don't act like you're a, a holy roller seven days a week. Sometimes we just want to get in the flesh and we just want to yell. We just want to grab somebody. But then you, the Holy Spirit reminds you behave <laughs> settle down son daughter and then you remind yourself when jesus comes he's going to straighten all this out some of us said amen hallelujah because you know what i'm talking about when jesus comes he'll straighten all this out and justice will be served that's a hard thing for a Christian. To, that's a big pill for a Christian to swallow. Amen. But we have to trust in the Lord. Amen. We have to trust in the things of God. Acts chapter 19 verse 11 through 20 says this. 
In Acts chapter 19, we see the church is very active. They're missionaries. They're moving. They're moving. They're moving. I mean, they're preaching the gospel. Paul's out there. Peter's out there. You know, they're all out there. They're starting up churches left and right. The gospel is just exploding right now. And, and the, by the time we get to Acts 19, there are churches everywhere. And right here in Acts 19, verse 11, it says this. It says, God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. It says, so that handkerchiefs or aprons were even carried from his body to the, to the, to the sick and diseases left them and evil spirits went out. You see, they were healing people left and right. It says here, but also some of the Jewish exorcists who went from place to place attempted to name over those who had the evil spirits saying, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. The seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish priest, were doing this. See, these were not Christians. These were the seven sons of a Jewish priest. You hear me now, church? These were not Christians. But they were going out imitating the church. Now watch this now. Listen up. Seven men who were not Christians, but were religious, were going out and doing the work of the church. In the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches. Because Paul was successful. He was casting those demons out. The church was successful. And so in verse 15, it says, And the evil spirit answered to them one day, saying, I recognize Jesus, and I know about Paul, but who are you? Oh, my goodness. If a devil ever tells you that. You, how, how did Mr. T tell Rocky? Dead meat, sucker. <laughs> you dead meat. <laughs> See, the devil said, I recognize Jesus. Every demon recognized Jesus. You know why? Because they've seen Jesus. <clears throat> because originally... Jesus created them as an angel. They recognize Jesus. They'll never forget that face of Jesus. Amen? They know who Jesus is. But see, this devil said, and I know about Paul. Meaning, I ain't met Paul, but some other demons told me, that's one bad dude. He done cast a couple of my buddies out. I've heard about Paul, but I recognize Jesus. You see what I'm saying? The demons ain't always everywhere. But this demon says, but who are you? When you go to that beer joint and you pick up those, th that beer, it's loaded with those demonic spirits. And they're coming into you and they're making you forget who God created you to be. When you inject those drugs, when you inject that pornography, when you inject that filth, that anger, that confusion into you, there are demonic spirits working through that, going into you to make you forget who God wants you to be. And these men thought that they could do a work of the church, the work of God, apart from God, and you cannot do that. Somebody needs to hear me this morning, whether they be in this room or be watching on the Internet, you are trying to live a good life. You are trying to do right. You are trying to have peace in your family. But if, if you don't know Jesus, you'll never get there. And guess what? The devil's going to have a field day. And he's going to beat you up. Let's finish this story. And the man in whom the devil was in, the de evil spirit was in, leaped on all seven of them and subdued all of them. One spirit subduing seven grown men. Seven. And overpowered them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. Sometimes the devil will expose you for who you are. You know, spiritually, take all those clothes off of you and wound you so badly 
you're in need of a Savior. This became known to all both Jews and Greeks who lived in Ephesus. And fear fell upon them all in the name of the Lord Jesus. And the name of the Lord Jesus was being magnified. Many, also all of those who had believed, kept coming. They were confessing and they were disclosing their practices. And many of those who practiced magic brought their books together and began burning them in the sight of everyone. And they counted up the price of them and founded 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord was growing mightily and prevailing. Now, a while back... uh, and a, a certain denomination, a religious faith, got mad because some Christians wanted to gather their books and burn them. Y'all remember that? They wanted to gather the Quran and burn them. But you see, biblically, when there's a revival, when Jesus is being front and center and you see salvation happening, you don't have to do that. People will bring their own sin and strongholds that had kept them down, they'll lay it before all the men to see, and they'll burn it themselves. We don't have to gather that church and cause more division. You understand what I'm saying? You'll never reach anybody by attacking them. Let them burn it themselves. Because, see, in here, these people were being saved because they saw the power of Christ through his church. And these people brought all their magic arts book. And they, 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 they brought all their, their books of, of, you know, of casting spells. And man, that was going on. They brought it themselves. They burned it up and they praised God and said, I'm done with this. Amen. You see, that's what we want to see. That's what we have to pray for to happen in this world. When we see those people of Islam, radical Islam, who are killing by the sword, when we see them take off their mask and throw it to the ground and raise up the cross of Christ and say, I'm sorry, I repent. And they burn that. Instead of burning the American flag, instead of burning the flags of the nations, they burn that mask that's hid their face. And they say, I come to Jesus now. You see, but we as Christians can't get caught up in this this war. We have to understand that we are at a bigger war with a bigger enemy than the one who carries a metal blade. Our enemy is someone who works in the minds and the hearts of, of all people, not just a certain specific race or ethnicity, but all over the world. Do you understand what I'm saying? Missionary, Christian, you are a missionary. Everything you do, you know, you may be the only Bible someone ever reads. You didn't hear that. I heard Pastor Carter Conlon say that one time. You may be the only Bible that someone will ever read. By the way you live your life, by what you read from the Bible, by, through your prayer life, and by you applying the Word of God in your everyday life, someone will see you, and that will be, for them... That will be the gospel. But if you're going to fiddle-faddle with stupidity and ignorance and playing around with things you ought not to play with, you stand before the, the, the judgment seat of Christ one day. And I'm not saying that you'll, you know Christians that live that way are going to go to hell. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is that there is a price to pay. Why do you think that in heaven Jesus says, I will wipe away every tear? Because there are going to be some people in heaven who are going to be crying because they're going to see where they should have gotten it and they missed it. And because of that, there are some that are going to be in hell. Now understand this. Jesus taught that the poor man in heaven could see the rich man in hell. I think maybe for a certain time period when the books of life are opened up and the great white throne judgment happens, I believe for a certain time period We all in heaven will see those in hell. Actually, the lake of fire. Because the Bible says even hell itself will be thrown in the lake of fire. And guess what? Some of you, you will see your mother, your father down there because you played with God on the earth. Some of you will see your daughters and your sons in hell 
because you didn't take Christ serious and you just got into heaven by the skin of your teeth. Some of you drank, drank up a storm and acted stupid and your kids grew up and saw that and then when you, they turned 25, you became a Christian and now you're trying to preach to them and they lie and go to hell. Many are going to be crying because you wasted time. You have been called for such a time as this. My children, I've told them, you're not going to go to heaven because your daddy's a pastor. You have to finish your race. You have to know Jesus. You have to pray. You have to fast. We did the best we could. But they are accountable. When they come of age, you are accountable. You who have, may not have kids, your little nieces, your nephews, those who look up to you. You don't even know, but some of you are role models. At your job, some of you are role models to others. But then when you go out on a Friday night and enjoy happy hour, you've just let them down. Your body is not your own. You were bought at a price, Christian. You are a missionary. What is more important than seeing a soul get saved? What is more important? I, as a pastor, have my job to do. You have your job to do. When we all do our job, the church will live and prosper. And guess what? The name of Jesus will be exalted high and glorified. I guess that doesn't motivate some of you. Some of you didn't clap. That was a place for a hand clap, brother and sister. Praise God. Praise God. He delivered you. He delivered me. He brought us out for such a time as this. Now is the time. I don't know the outcome of this story, but the two Japanese that are being held by ISIS... One of them is a Christian. And to make a long story short, his buddy got caught. And this Christian said, I got to go look for him. I'm the one that told him about the Middle East. I'm the one that helped get him connections. I got to go look for him. You know, the Bible says, no greater love than a man lay down his life for his brother. And so this Christian, knowing he would probably get caught, went out to look for his brother. And he got caught. And I don't know if it's true or not. I don't know. They're still trying to verify. But this Japanese Christian brother of ours is holding a picture of his friend dead. They don't know if that's true or not, that they're trying to verify. But guys, we, we are in for the fight. We are in for the fight. The greatest fight that this world will ever see. Amen. Amen. We are setting up. We are being set up. By the hand of God. Because only God sets these kinds of things up. God doesn't cause war. God doesn't cause death. But you and you were called for such a time as this. That either you're going to live by the sword and die by the sword or you're going to live by the word of God Amen. and possibly die but be raised to life by the word of God. Amen. Because I tell you what you see in your TVs happening around the world, it will happen here. It will happen in America. The United States Constitution, and I love this nation, but... We are losing it, church. We are losing it. The Supreme Court is going to determine by June if to redefine marriage. I love all people. We are not at battle with homosexuals. Don't you ever, ever, ever disrespect anyone who doesn't know Christ. 
You see, I understand that because I know what it means to go to the prison and hold hands with someone who killed their baby or killed their wife. Those very hands. Jesus died on a cross and said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They, sometimes they really don't know what they're doing. Not all, but some of them don't know what they're doing. But we have to know when to walk away, too. Because we have to uphold the standard of God in, our, in the church. But the Supreme Court is going to, is coming to a, 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 a collision, a crash course, a, a, an encounter with this, so to speak. And, I, and, I've, and, and the Holy Spirit has allowed me to preach and understand this for a number of years. That there are many sins, but the sin of sexual morality is a little more grievous than others. And when we as a nation commit that, the judgment comes. Look at Sodom and Gomorrah. Why did destruction come upon them, the judgment and wrath of God? Because of sexual sin. Why did the flood come upon the earth? Because of sexual sin. The sons of God were going into the daughters of men. They were creating the Nephilim. And God said, my spirit will not deal with this. It will not contend with this. Sexual morality, both times. What did Jesus say? Just as it was in the days of Noah, the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, so shall it be the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Sexual immorality is front and center. And if our nation bites that hook and falls for it, the nation is now lost. We have been slowly, state by state by state, conforming to this. And when this is across all 50 states, we've lost. We've lost. So now, church, understand your mission. Your mission. Not, do you love America? Because I know you do. But do you love people? Because God loves people. Amen. And we have to be sincere and right living with Christ to see people get saved. You are a missionary. And many of you understand what this is. This is a, a long message and I'm going to end it now. But this is a message that I believe is very timely. Hear this, church, and those watching. Some of you have ministries that you need to step into right now. Amen. And you've been circling, circling, and circling. I know because I circled for 15 years. And so you need to get along with the Lord that he will give you direction and understanding. And don't walk away from what God has prepared for you. Amen. Don't. Because I wake up every morning and I, I, though I have so much responsibilities, but I love where God has me because I know that I am doing what I was put on this earth to do. Amen. And you want to have that too because when you know that and you live that, you're going to see the fruit. You're going to bear fruit, spiritual fruit, and it's going to glorify the Lord. Do you receive that? Yes. Father, I thank you. I praise you.